Everybody, this is Rob Keens with GoldSilverPros.com. Uh, it is Thursday, December 14th, 2023. Uh, this will be the first of a two video series on the central bank digital currencies. I'm going to do this one this week and then the next one on the 21st, a week from now on next Thursday's video. And I wanted to break this up into two segments. Because I think basically it takes two. The first uh, segment is going to be talking about the various projects used in the creation of uh, central bank digital currencies is going to define the digital currencies uh, and it's going to give you an idea of all the projects that have been going on setting this up. And the reason I did this is because a lot of people still don't understand that the new system is already being developed uh, post the dollar error. There are a lot of people who still think the dollar is going to last forever and it won't. The new era is already being developed. There are currently over 120 projects going on in the central bank digital currency space. Or I should say 120 digital currencies under some sort of development or have been developed I think a few are actually out there in beta testing, but there have been a lot of projects around implementing uh, trade of these amongst each other and solving some of the, some of the other problems with the fiat money area, which I'll get into. So that's the first video. Now, this video is going to be a bit more technical. It's going to have a bit more of an academic feel to it, but that's necessary before we get to video two. In video two, I'm going to talk about the last two projects that I won't have on this video the implications of those projects. And we're going to talk about consequences, risks, that type of thing there. And I, and in that second video, I'm going to give you my overall view of what central bank digital currencies are really there for, the problems they're there for, and what risks that they may pose overall, uh, especially to us as individuals. Um, I'm not going to get to that in the first video because I need to talk about what central bank digital currencies are. Uh, I would say it's very, very important that you listen to this first video because this first video is really going to give you the information that you need to understand what's really going on. The, you, a lot of you guys will probably gravitate to the second video more in terms of the content and the way that I'm going to present it. But I'd urge you to watch this first one first. In fact, watch it twice before we get to the second one. Because without the knowledge I present in this one, it's going to be very hard to understand the end state and where I think uh, the central bit bank digital currencies are really designed to go. And, and I think that will be very, very interesting. All right, we're going to get into the presentation and just jump right into it. This is the future of central bank money, digital currencies. Uh, this is the first of the two presentations. Uh, this is the traditional payment flow. This is what happens now. This is the fiat currency system. This is what happens if we're sending money from one jurisdiction to another, from one country to another. You can see on here, and this comes from a SWIFT paper, and all of the references will be at the very end. I'll show you guys. Uh, country A, a payer sends money to their, from their originating bank to a couple of intermediary banks. Eventually, it gets to the beneficiary, the person receiving the money. And country B, there have to be a bunch of SWIFT messages along the way. It's slow. It doesn't always get there. Uh, it's inefficient and costly. And part of the reason for the central bank digital currencies is to solve this problem. It's not only to have a central bank digital currency to supplant the dominance of the dollar. They're also using the central bank digital currencies, linking them together in a framework to allow them to be sent internationally in multiple different ways, multiple different formats, whether it be from a regular bank to a regular bank or central bank to central bank. And we'll get into the different types of central bank digital currencies that need to exist for that. To happen. So central bank digital currencies uh, are being created for a couple of reasons, uh, and we'll get into that. Problems with the current system, this comes from a BIS paper, uh, unclear FX rates, which means foreign exchange rates, uh, what the rates are, if you're trading, if you're sending from one currency to another and one of them or both of them are relatively liquid or they're not main currency, sometimes it's very unclear as to what the exchange rate should be, or the exchange rates may be exorbitant, so it's not efficient. Uh, the banking system may have different operating hours. It's operating 20, you know, 24 different time zones across the world, but the banks aren't open 24-7. Uh, they also may use various communication standards, various data types, various systems. And what makes it really difficult is a lot of the intermediary banks you saw in the previous slide, these intermediary banks, one, two, and three, may have to employ multiple systems and they may have to do a manual step in between those systems to get it to work. So let's say country A is USA, they're using SWIFT, country B doesn't use SWIFT or it uses something else of a, a, of a banking app. There may need to be banks in between, commercial banks in between that have access to both systems and then they have to facilitate that trade, maybe even manually, maybe they can't do it across systems. And that's where the cost and the time and the expense off, often comes in. You have high costs to 
sustained relations with multiple intermediaries, high cost of compliance for regulations across borders and limited transparency on the payment. So if you're talking about anti-money laundering or that type of thing, uh, regulating it is very difficult with the current system and they want to make that easier. That's a big component of the central bank digital currency system that's coming. And again, central bank digital currencies are not just a replacement for the dollar or a replacement for the yuan or a replacement for the pound. They're also a new network for sending and using currencies that address a lot of other issues. Uh, here's some details on challenges and cross-border payments. This is where you may want to pause the video and read through. I'm just going to give you a high level on this, but there are high costs. It's slow. There's limited access and there's low transparency. And transparency means what the payments are being made for. Do they fit regulations? Is it criminal, not criminal? Who's doing it? How do you track it? Very hard to track things with the current system. Some people may see that as a benefit. Some people definitely from a regular perspective see that as a detriment, uh, that last point there. Solution models. So there's been three basic solution models based on CBDCs. This is a very busy eye chart or busy graphic, if you will. So this may be another one where you want to pause the video and go back and look at this for a moment or simply go to the end with all of the links and browse to the links and bring this up on your computer when you have time. I'm not going to go through in detail, but basically three models have been tried for central bank digital currencies. And that's really what I mean by that is three models have been tried for central bank digital currency transfer systems, cross-border payments, so that the central bank digital currencies are interoperable. Uh, so again, they're not just replacing the fiat paper currencies with digital units. They're also replacing the network and how these are traded. Again, for all the reasons that I've talked about. So the legacy uh, technology platforms, how is that solved by these three models? You have three different models. You have uh, the model one is a CBDC arrangement based upon compatible CBDC systems. So each central bank deploys its own system, but they have compatibility and standards such as ISO uh, as 2000 or 20022, for example, or other systems. That's model one. Model two is an arrangement based upon interlinked CBDC systems. So systems that are already interlinked and therefore must be used using uh, common development. Now they're different systems, different iterations of them, but they're interlinked either using common development standards or they're interlinked using middleware or uh, basically software developed to interlink those systems together and communicate with one another. And then the third one is a multi-currency single system. It's one system that everybody uses that just has different currencies. There are risk and rewards to each one of these. Personally, I think model three, uh, that's the solution I think that ultimately is going to be proposed by most nations, but that's the one that's going to take the most time to get collaboration on. Because when you're using a single system, the question becomes who's regulating that system, who's setting out the rules. Each country, each jurisdiction has its own culture and political standards. It's very difficult to get everybody to agree on anything in money. Think about your family. How many people in your family agree on how to spend money, how to use money, especially when an inheritance comes up? Then think about how much bigger those issues become when you're talking about monetary systems across the world for, for whole countries and for whole cultures that, that grew up with different standards, different religions, different political systems in different states of industrialization or uh, their technical infrastructure. I mean, there's a lot of different things to consider there. So CBDCs do settle a lot of problems outright. Any of these systems, for example, you'll see solves a limited operating hours situation because these systems are automated. They run all the time. Uh, they reduce the amount of long transaction chains. You may not need three intermediaries. You may just need a, uh, a sender and a receiver in some cases. And in some cases, the sending and receiving system can be the same system. So that, that gets solved very quickly. There are other problems here that can get addressed. There are pros and cons. I'll let you guys go through these, but just know that there have been three models proposed. Ultimately, I think model three is where uh, the the overall impetus is going to be, although we may go through stages to get to model three. And I'll show you why at the end, I think the most of the work is being done on model three, even though there are going to be problems getting that actually implemented right now. All right. Now, this is a busy graphic of model one, two and three. Again, this is probably where you want to stop your video or just you know blow this up in your screen while I'm talking about it. Model one arrangement based upon compatible CBD systems. It basically shows one central bank digital currency a one central bank digital currency b a is in blue b is in red and then what has to happen they're autonomous systems there's information flow between them 
And then there are pros and cons over on the right that you can read through. Uh, there's model two arrangement based upon interlinked CBDC systems. They're interlinked, so there's more of a direct connection. It solves more problems, but it requires more collaboration between the participants. So think about getting China and Russia and the US and Saudi Arabia and Chile all to agree to, to a common set of standards so that you can use model two versus would it be easier given the current state of political and cultural relations across all these countries around the world just to use model one. So some people say model one may be the first that actually gets implemented, but I think they want to move to model three. If you look at model three, it's basically one system with just different units in it. Think about having different uh, iterations of Bitcoin in the same ecosystem. Country A has their Bitcoin one, country B has their Bitcoin two, country C has their Bitcoin three, but the, the chain and the network itself is really one system with just different sort of coins on top. And that's a very crude and not quite accurate representation of Model 3, but it's just a quickie for those that kind of understand the cryptos and understand what I'm talking about there. All right, moving on. We also have to talk about the two levels of central bank digital currencies. There's two levels. There is a wholesale level, which is meant for central bank to central bank level. It's for big banking transaction settlement, big amounts, relatively infrequent, okay? Not millions of times a second or anything like that big amounts uh, at the top level of the system. And then there's retail. And the retail is meant for the public to use in settling financial transactions, buying groceries, stuff like that. So here is a quote from Cointelegraph. Uh, there are several vital differences between CBD, uh, CBDCs and retail CBDCs that relate to their use, who uses them and their impacts. Importantly, wholesale CBDCs are meant for use in interbank settlements and other financial transactions between institutions and other eligible market participants. This would be like corresponding banks or big commercial banks. Okay, in contrast, retail CBDCs are planned for use by the general public and other institutions, in institutions further down the financial food chain, if you will, smaller institutions, maybe your credit unions if they're still going to exist, maybe other financial institutions like brokerage houses, maybe other institutions like uh, money clearing or just any institution that needs to use uh, the CBDC, but they're a smaller institution, maybe not even a bank in that case. Okay, moving on. Here's some some metrics to know or some differences between wholesale CBDCs and retail, and I will go over this in a little bit detail. Uh, wholesale CBDCs are for financial institutions, where retail CBDCs for the general public. The use cases for wholesale CBDC is for interbank settlements, wholesale level transactions, big transactions. The retail CBDC is what you would have on your phone or with your card for the for the average user out there in the public, Joe Public, as a mon monetary policy tool. Uh, the wholesale CBDC, there's less impact on the money supply and demand because we're talking about infrequent large transactions. So they're not you can set interest rates on the wholesale CBDCs, but it wouldn't necessarily affect directly mortgage rates and things like that. It would more affect settlement of CBDCs amongst big uh, central banks and, and big banks. Whereas the retail CBDCs would have a significant direct impact on the monetary supply and a monetary demand. This is where you would see them setting interest rates to guide you know, where those currencies would trade and, and impact the money supply overall. Impact on traditional finance. On wholesale CBDCs, it's not traditional finance, it's bank to bank, so it's limited. And privacy concerns is limited because wholesale, CB, wholesale CBDC is not linked to an individual per se. It's really linked to the central banks. Uh, retail CBDCs uh, impact on traditional finance big because think of that as dollars today. Retail CBDC is more like the dollars you see today. And the privacy concern is significant because of its on chain. You're using, for example, if you're using distributed ledger technology or the blockchain, then you're going to be able to know every single transaction. And this is where privacy concerns come in for the average everyday user. Again, that's from Cointelegraph again. So there are various projects that the central banks are using uh, or implementing or testing out, if you will, going through testing. This is all headed by the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements. There have been many projects facilitated, designed to, the current, designed to address the current issues of the fiat monetary system. And again, not just the fact that we have one dominant currency, but all these other problems. Dollar dominance on trade and settlement, but also inability of fiat monetary systems to maintain value over time. We've seen that in history. Settlement times and delays, privacy, regulation, efficiency, and many more factors. So central bank digital currencies are not just a new type of currency. It is a new financial system. At least the connectivity of that system 
then the facilitation of trade within that system is completely changing. And we're going to get some videos which kind of explain this in a little bit easier format for you guys here in a moment. So if your eyes are glazing over at this point, you're like, oh my God, this is you know getting a little bit high level for me. Don't worry, you can go back. You can either go to the references at the end, you can go back and stop and look at some of these uh, different artifacts. If you don't understand them, we've got some videos coming up for you. A couple of projects I'm going to talk about, Cedar and Ubin Plus, uh, Cedar Phase 2 and Ubin Plus are a research project exploring potential improvements for multi-currency wholesale cross-border payments. So now we're talking about trading these currencies across the border, and we're also talking about doing multiple ones at a time, not just dollars to euros, but maybe dollars to euros to yen, or dollars to euros and yen to euros and dollars to yen. And, and then you may also throw in you know, the Aussie dollar in there. Uh, you, we, we, they want a system that facilitates trade amongst all currencies at the same time. And this is where uh, Cedar and Ubin come in. Uh, the project examined whether wholesale central bank digital currencies developed using distributed ledger technology, DLT or blockchain, if you will, could improve the efficiency and transparency of cross-border payments involving one or more vehicle currencies. This collaboration brings together Project Cedar, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York's Innovation Center, and the UBIN Plus of the Monetary Authority of Singapore. So this is the Fed in Singapore, a monetary authority working together. Uh, and, and Cedar and UBIN basically are two different frameworks that are designed to do the same thing. And they're saying, hey, can we kind of smush these together and use distributed ledger uh, technology here to do it? So if anybody thought that the Fed was not involved in looking at blockchain or distributed ledger technology in uh, central bank digital currencies or was not involved in central bank digital currencies with regard specifically to uh, the digital dollar or any other currency, here's proof that there is because this paper came from the Fed's New York Innovation Center. I think that settles that argument. Looking at their high level concept. Now it goes much deeper in the paper that I have referenced at the end, but basically you can see uh, currency A and their CBDC ledger, and they're using uh, a combined tech stack of Cedar and UBIN. Then you've got the Singapore, which is uses UBIN. Then you've got the USD, which uses Cedar. And then you've got currency B. So it's just talking about how to use this technology to facilitate multiple transactions using two different existing uh, technology stacks, if you will. In other words, they're trying to say, can we use existing technology stacks, unite them in some way and trade currencies across the world? Well, you can. Uh, the problem is it requires common governance, which is an issue. That was an issue at the very beginning. Um, it's possible. Uh, I don't think this is going to be the ultimate solution, but it's it's part and parcel of what's ultimately going to be the solution for central bank digital currencies and cross-border payments. Then there's Project Icebreaker. I'm going to play a video on that here in a moment. It, it concludes an experiment for a new architecture for cross-border retail CBDCs. We're going to play that one now. Communicating or sending large amounts of data around the world is cheap and easy. But sending money to another country is usually expensive and slow. The way money travels across the globe relies on many intermediaries, increasing the complexity, time and cost of transactions. One of the main difficulties is that most payment systems are designed for domestic payments, not for international payments, and often do not communicate with similar systems in another country. The reasons for this vary, for example, due to differences in legislation and technical systems and different working hours in various countries. The development of central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, and the underlying technologies that can be used could offer a solution. CBDCs used between consumers and merchants are known as retail CBDCs. Retail CBDCs could offer advantages such as faster transactions, more competition in payments, lower risks and safety in the form of central bank money. Countries around the world are researching and experimenting with retail CBDCs, with many pilots underway. The central banks of Israel, Norway and Sweden have joined forces with the BIS Innovation Hub Nordic Centre in Project Icebreaker, which aims to explore how retail CBDC systems can be linked together to enable efficient international payments. Project Icebreaker is exploring a specific model linking national retail CBDC systems together. The Icebreaker Hub routes payments and allows national CBDC systems to talk to each other, despite being based on different technologies. 
In this project, different distributed ledger technologies used by each country for their proof-of-concept CBDC systems were connected to the Icebreaker Hub. Let's see how this works. Say Alice in Stockholm wants to send money to Noah in Tel Aviv to pay for a camera she bought online. When she enters Noah's payment address and the amount into her mobile app, the Icebreaker Hub helps her find the best available exchange rate. This is calculated from the rates foreign exchange providers submit to the Icebreaker Hub. Alice's payment is then broken down into two payments, one in Swedish e krona to a foreign exchange provider in Sweden, and another in Israeli digital shekels from the foreign exchange provider in Israel to NOAA. These two payments are coordinated using a form of digital escrow known as a hash time locked contract, HTLC. The payment from Alice to the foreign exchange provider will only be released if the foreign exchange provider has paid NOAA. If no foreign exchange provider can exchange Swedish e krona for Israeli digital shekels, the icebreaker hub will find a bridge currency, for example, Norwegian krona, that can be exchanged for both Swedish e krona and Israeli digital shekels, and will use that to bridge the gap. Swedish e krona are exchanged for Norwegian krona, which is in turn exchanged for Israeli digital shekels. The hub will always choose the payment path that is cheapest for the payer. The benefits of the model demonstrated in the project are it enables cross-border interoperability, allowing systems with different technologies to talk to each other in a standardised way. It reduces settlement and counterparty risk by the use of coordinated payments in central bank money. It allows increased competition and choice for consumers by decoupling payers from specific foreign exchange providers as well as through the use of bridge currencies. It helps reduce costs. It helps achieve increased cross-border reach. It is scalable, easily connecting the systems of many countries. It is fast. Transactions take just seconds to complete. And CBDC does not need to leave a national CBDC system. Project Icebreaker has demonstrated that central banks can implement different technologies for their national CBDC systems that meet their needs and enable cross-border payments with minimal requirements. Further areas of work are still necessary, but the lessons so far can guide central banks when designing their national retail CBDC systems. Project Icebreaker – Breaking New Paths for Cross-Border Payments Okay, so essentially on that one, you got the deal with Icebreaker and what it's intended to do. We're going to move on to the next is Project Dunbar, uh, international settlements using multiple CBDCs. This was led by the BIS Innovation Hub in partnership with Bank of Australia, Bank of Malaysia, Monetary Authority of Singapore there again, and the South African Reserve Bank. One of the reasons I'm putting the participants in all of these, you can see there are many central banks working on this. Some of the projects, including Enbridge, we'll get to in a moment, have multiple sponsors. Enbridge, I think, has 25 or 30 uh, involved, including the New York Fed. So this is a worldwide thing across different cultures, time zones, all of that stuff. This is everybody jumping in on this thing all at one time. And we're going to see that with Project Dunbar, which we'll talk about here next in the next video. This is a shorter video, by the way. This one's only a couple of minutes. That last one was about four and a half. So we're going to get done with the video here pretty quickly. And then I'll preview video two for next week. But stay with me. We've got a few more minutes to go. Let's talk about Project Dunbar. Cross-border payments can be slow and expensive, but does it have to be? Domestic payments are usually fast and inexpensive because most banks connect to a single national payments platform. But there is no single international platform for cross-border payments. Instead, to make cross-border payments, banks need to hold foreign currency accounts with banks in other countries. This is the decades-old model of correspondent banking. A single cross-border payment may pass through multiple correspondent banks, adding costs and delays along the way. But what if we could merge all these separate banking systems and bring them onto one single common platform? That's the goal of Project Dunbar. 
we are exploring the benefits of a single international payments platform, similar to the national platforms that many developed economies rely upon. This single international platform will connect multiple central banks and commercial banks. Each central bank will be able to use this shared platform to issue their digital currencies, or CBDCs. Banks can then use these CBDCs in multiple currencies to make payments to each other. These payments would be direct from bank to bank with no intermediaries. This streamlined process means payments will be cheaper and faster. Let's see how it works step by step. First, central banks issue their CBDCs representing different currencies on the shared platform. Banks will be able to hold and transact with both local and foreign CBDCs. Local banks can exchange for CBDCs using their central bank balances on domestic payments networks. Non-local banks will be able to exchange CBDCs with other banks and hold CBDCs even from countries they do not have a presence in. As a result, it will be possible for all banks to pay each other directly in all the different CBDCs. However, while we can look forward to streamlined, cheaper and faster cross-border payments, there are challenges to overcome. The first challenge is governance. How do we get multiple central banks to share a common platform? Who will own and operate the platform? Can we resolve the national security concerns that come from sharing critical infrastructures with other central banks? The second challenge is access. How do we allow non-local banks to access and make payments with CBDCs? Can central banks trust banks from other jurisdictions when they do not supervise those banks directly? The final challenge is regulations and jurisdictional boundaries. Payment regulations are different in each country, so how do we simplify the cross-border payments flow while respecting these differences? BIS is working with multiple partners to solve these challenges. The ultimate goal is for a common settlement platform for multi-CBDCs in order to make cross-border payments cheaper, faster and safer. Okay, you see what they have with Project Dunbar and what it does in helping facilitate cross-border payments, maybe even bank to bank, really cutting down the intermediaries, not necessarily needing a central bank, digital, uh, central bank to authorize that transaction. So they're talking about multiple ways in which you can send a retail central bank digital currency, a wholesale central bank digital currency, using these technologies across the world very quickly, settling transactions and connecting together really the different currencies around the world in a quick format and having a lot of regulatory oversight and transparency, meaning they can see the transactions in the system. Lastly, we come to Project Enbridge. This is sort of what I look at as a big daddy or basically a connector project for everything. Uh, it experiments with multiple central bank digital currencies. It's a common platform for wholesale cross-border payments. It seeks to solve some of the key inefficiencies of existing systems with cross-border payments, such as cost, speed, transparency, again, ability to see transactions and who's doing them, and operational complexities, meaning different platforms, stages of maturity, that type of thing. This Embridge is sort of the glue behind it all to get all of this stuff really connected together. And on top here, I have a graphic showing sort of the existing system. If you're a payer, you would use, the payer's bank would, would conduct their anti-money laundering and know your customer regulations as denoted in the text down there below the graphic. The payer's bank sends it over to a correspondent bank. Uh, the correspondent bank is one, a bigger bank that facilitates international transactions. Think the super banks that we have in the U.S. goes over to the correspondent bank and the other jurisdiction, the super bank over there, or just a big commercial bank. Then it eventually goes to the payee's bank. What Enbridge does is it says, nah, just go straight from your bank to the next bank. We don't need to involve the big commercial banks. We don't need to involve the central banks. Just send that, you know, that currency, retail currency from one to another across jurisdictions. And Enbridge is the glue or the piece in the middle they built to facilitate all of that. And it has common connectors. I'm not going to go into all of the technology, but it's a common uh, language that they're using to develop this. It is a common standardization framework. And so you would have to get all the participants to agree to it. But if they did, 
this basically would be a super system of connecting re different retail currencies, central bank digital currencies together across the world. And just from an efficiency standpoint, it'd be fantastic. From a transparency and privacy standpoint, uh, people may not like that one quite as much. Two graphics here on M Enbridge. I just wanted to stick on one quick slide on the left. Enbridge is set to solve all of these problems. Uh, problems as seen by the central bank and other regulatory authorities with privacy, um, confidentiality, a unique identification, easy deployment, a shared knowledge, interoperability, the ability to work together across the system, which is the current system does not have, uh, performance and transparency as well. And the bottom right, though, this would require a steering committee with four uh, subcommittees on it, regulating policy. And policy would be uh, finding who did what or how what happened, legal versus legal matters, technology is the technology in there, and then you have compliance, are people doing what they say they're going to be doing? This would be under a governing steering committee who would run that steering committee. That would be interesting. Would you rotate in different international participants? There's a lot that would need to be solved there, I think, for this system to actually work in the real world. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, by the way, this is not the end of the series. This is the first video in the series. There's one more coming. There are two more projects I did not discuss here, at least two. I think I'll focus on two. There's kind of a third in there. Uh, and I'm going to talk more in the next one about once we've gone through all of this, what does it really mean? What does it really mean? What are the causes? Why are we going to this system? What are the consequences if the system gets put into place? The risks, both at an international and a regulatory level, but also to the individual and what are the cures, the potential, I'll say, alternatives to the system or other cures for existing bank woes. What could those be or would any of those interest us? That's going to be the video I think people will take more interest in. But to understand that video, again, this one is an absolute must watch to understand what's going on. Uh, here's my references. I'll leave up here and I'll, I'll leave a few comments. You can uh, take a screenshot of this if you want to go look at those documents. Um, the one thing to remember here is a lot of information about central bank digital currencies on popular social media is, is part. It's a piece. It's a puzzle piece. Think about getting a 500 piece puzzle. And it may have five pieces in this video and three over here and eight over here, maybe 21 over here. You're getting closer, you know, a big chunk with that one. But I don't know if anybody's really sort of going over the whole thing and talking about the pieces and why we're getting there. And so that's why I wanted to do this video. I kind of wanted to do this video as like a glue video, if you will. This video kind of puts together a lot of these concepts. It really helps us understand what the heck is going on. Um, and it'll help us when we get to the second video and understand why this system's being put into place. Do we want it to be put into place? Is this the solution for all of us? Would it work? What are the timelines? We'll go over all that stuff in the next one. And I think those are sort of the big questions. The, those are the problem we're trying to solve. Do we want central bank digital currencies? What is it exactly? Uh, and a lot of the information out there is kind of piecemeal. Now you can do your own research. I always encourage it. Please do your own research. Please go look at the BIS's website and just go look up BIS. Uh, CBDC projects in your search engine, it'll bring up a page with a list of projects, go down to every one, go hit Wikipedia, you know, go hit YouTube. There are videos out there. If you do search terms, you know, spend some time on it. Like I did by, by all means do that. But I think this video is a pretty good summary of what the central bank digital currency projects going on are about a 90% summary and then 10% uh, left in the next video talking about two projects I'm not going to mention here because those projects dovetail into the bigger question, the bigger concern. Do we actually want this? What problem is this really solving? Who is it solving it for? Do we care? Do we not care? I think at the end of that second video, uh, do we care is going to be a resounding yes for most people that watch it. But again, this is a foundational piece to CBDC that you understand what they are then we'll get to, to the capstone piece, the second piece, where we'll talk about all the rest of that stuff. And I think you guys are going to find that super interesting. Uh, that's the one I'm probably going to have a lot of fun doing. Uh, thanks for sticking with me. Um, I'm sort of out of pocket right now. That's why I got the virtual background. But I wanted to do this video this week. I think it's time to do it by end of year because timeframes, I think CBDCs are going to take a little while to get implemented. They're not going to come out tomorrow. They're coming out on January 1, but they're closer than many people think. I wanted to show the projects involved to say, hey, They've been doing this stuff for a long time. All these papers have been coming out since 2020, 2021. And when you're talking about distributed ledger technology, think about all the private crypto product projects, the, the, the 10,000 private cryptos that have developed a lot of this DeFi uh, concept, develop, developed a lot of this blockchain concept, developed a lot of this private cryptocurrency coins. 
that's now being borrowed from for the centralized authorities to use and modify for their own use in their own system. It's kind of a, you know, a race between the two systems and the digital systems matter. I know a lot of you guys are gold and silver guys, but we're living in a digital world, man. And if you don't understand this, you don't understand a threat to your gold portfolio and you don't understand where the new monetary system is going, whether you, you want it to or not. The question is, is there, can we get involved as private citizens in this debate and this discussion? One thing you'll notice with all this, and I'll talk about this in the second video, is a lot of this done by international bodies. What about our sovereignty? What about our state law, our local law, our federal law? You know, how does that all play in? What about our privacy concerns? If we get complete transparency, remember the graphics I put up where it talked about transparency. And I talked about the Enbridge project where you had that one group that was looking into the policy group that would look into things around individual transactions or groups of transactions. Do you want your financial information viewable by an international agency, you know, across the world? Is that something that you're interested in? We'll talk about that more in the second video. But I think this video brings up the key pieces. Certainly there are other projects involved. There's Mariana and a few others you may want to go look at. I brought you the key ones, kind of outlines what central bank digital currencies are. It's not just a digital version of the existing. It's completely different. It is a digital version, but it's got different controls, different regulations, different standards put at this level. So it changes the regula regulation of our monetary system from a state, local, and federal combined federalist model that we have to an international model. And it does a lot of other things. It builds a network. Uh, now, are there benefits? Will it make it more efficient to send money than the existing wire system? Oh, heck yeah. Um, will allow cheaper you know, monetary payments? Sure. Faster? Sure. Uh, will it mitigate some of the problems of having one world dominant currency, such as the dollar being the world reserve currency? Absolutely. I, I think it will do that. But there could be other concerns that we have as individuals, specifically in America, but other freedom loving nations that we want to take a look at. And again, I'll get more into that in a second video. This is foundational, though. You got to understand this video. Please go through it a couple of times. If, if you have any trouble, stop on the exhibits, read through it, go to the links I had at the very end. Hopefully you screen printed that, you know, all that kind of stuff. Really get into that kind of stuff a little bit. Spend a couple hours if you have time. I know you guys are busy. If you have time, spend a couple hours. And then the video next week is going to be really interesting. Trust me on that one. That's the one you guys are going to go, wow, I didn't know that. I didn't think about that. And that is interesting. You're going to have that response. I can pretty much guarantee. Thank you so much, guys, for tuning in to part one of the CBDC series here on www.goldsilverpros.com. Till next week, this is Rob Keats with Gold Silver Pros.